I'd like to present an argument today for the sake of helping you to expand your consciousness and possibly obtain a new skill that you already had but that people have told you that you don't have by chalking things off as a medical diagnosis. I found that the universe communicates in very interesting ways since I've actually been paying much more attention to things going on around me. And so for the last year and a half, if you have been taking a look at the stuff that I put out, you notice I flash a lot of pictures on the screen. I show you a lot of things. I show you, for example, the things that I have seen in the Orion Nebula and so forth, these things that the logical brain would tell you don't exist. But what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to present to you something. I found an interesting video that explains in about two minutes using an excellent analogy what I've been trying to explain for about a year and a half. And once that's completed, what I'd like to try to do is to satisfy the left logical brain in such a manner that will allow your right brain to function enough so that you can explore this for yourself. And we're going to take a look at pareidolia and we're going to take a look at how valid that diagnosis actually is and how real it actually is and we're going to compare it to some other technologies. But first I want you to listen to this video. This is a short clip I took from another channel and I think it really does a great job of trying to explain what I've been trying to show you for such a long time. In our current perceptions we think of other states as being out there like out in space and we use the term other dimensions but still, because we can never really imagine anything except according to forms already existing in our mind, you know, as a result of the experiences that we've had, we project those forms out there. But all those projections aren't out there. They're just an entertaining rehash of our current level of perception. Because we always imagine in terms of time and space. But that's just the stuff of science fiction. And even the limitation of leading edge science. Quantum physicists already admit openly that they can only describe the boundary of human perception, but they can't penetrate it or escape it. So what other way is there to experience? What do other higher dimensions really mean? Which way's up? Which way's out? Take a look at this thing. You ever seen one of these before? If you haven't, then you should really get out more. If you've never seen one of these things, then it looks to you like a random spattering of marks. You know, maybe there's a pattern, but if there is, it's completely abstract, right? Actually, it's not abstract at all. Every mark in the pattern serves a purpose, and the purpose can't be achieved without it. This is a, a 3D image, and it's encoded into two dimensions. And if you use your sense of sight the way that you normally do, you won't be able to see the 3D picture. But there's a method. So now, if you succeed, then you see the picture, it appears to you. So it's obvious now that the higher dimension always existed along with the lower one, right? And that the lower one could only have been created with the knowledge of what image should be contained in the higher one. Now think about this. The idea to create such a thing as a three-dimensional image hidden in a two-dimensional drawing that would give you the pleasure of effort and discovery and revelation, that comes from an infinitely higher and quantitatively different dimension. One that you could never have imagined by just focusing on dots separated in space on the screen. And that thought's encoded into the 2D image. So you see, each higher state is more inclusive, more creative, less material, and more caring and intentional. Of course, we only get there if we wanted enough to learn how to do it. Interesting. Well, using the stereogram analogy, he's basically proved that what may look like grains on a piece of paper to somebody, the other person may see something actually in this. And we can see that the message actually may be intelligent. So consider this. Consider that no one has ever heard of stereogram. So when presented this, you don't know what to look for. To you, it's just random dots on a page. But to some, to some that have found a way to break through that barrier, would know. But yet, everyone is told that, hey, you're just seeing random dots on a piece of paper. You're just seeing things. Let's expand. This is pareidolia. This is the common diagnosis used to explain the phenomena when somebody actually sees something. I find it very interesting that the first thing that they show 
is the face on Mars to let everyone know that when they go to Wikipedia to look up pareidolia, that the face on Mars is definitely pareidolia. Well, let's take a look at the definition. It says it's a psychological phenomenon involving a vague and random stimulus, often an image or sound being perceived as significant. Down here it says pareidolia is type of apophenia. Well, let's check out the definition of apophenia. Apophenia is the experience of seeing meaningful patterns or connections in random or meaningless data. Well, now that's twice that they've said that. The first time they've said whether the data is significant or not, and the second time they've said patterns or connections in random or meaningless data. The question that you should ask yourself in both of these cases is, who gets to decide whether the data is random or meaningless or not? As we've already proven so far, that in an unknown system, where we didn't know what a stereogram was. It's very obvious that to some people this would look like random dots on a page, but to others who have broken through the communication barrier on this would see that there's actually an intelligent or conscious message hidden behind the dots on this page. So once again, who gets to decide what is random or meaningless data? Okay, so we know that Wikipedia is not always the best place to go for our information, so we have to check other sources. Let's take a look at what PubMed.gov says. The tendency to perceive faces in random patterns exhibiting configural properties of faces is an example of pareidolia. Here is what the government site uses as an example of faces that is pareidolia. If you notice, what you see basically are two holes for eyes and a hole for a mouth and once in a while you may see a bent line which would represent either a smiley face or an unhappy face or a surprised face. The scientific method is the means by which researchers are able to make conclusive statements about their studies with a minimum of bias. The interpretation of data, for example, the result of a new drug study, can be laden with bias. The researcher often has personal stakes in the results of his work. What is the purpose of the scientific method? The scientific method is the means by which researchers are able to make conclusive statements about their studies with a minimum of bias. The interpretation of data, for example, the result of a new drug study, can be laden with bias. The researcher often has a personal stakes in the results of his work. Any skilled debater knows just about any opinion can be justified, presented as fact. In order to minimize the influence of personal stakes and biased opinions, a standard method of testing a hypothesis is expected to be used by all members of the scientific community. Based on their examples provided, I would have to agree that these man-made objects having very simple designs would fall nicely into the category for pareidolia or apophenia. However, the fact that I agree or disagree is irrelevant in performing a test of this nature. Although 99.9% .9 of us would agree that man-made electrical outlet is not meaningful, we must submit to the fact that this places the data into the classification of range data rather than criteria that can be labeled true or false. After reading the report on the tests that were performed, I was left scratching my head on a couple of things. First, there were no tests performed showing gradual increases in meaningful versus meaningless data. There was only meaningful and meaningless. It would be the same as getting a test where in one picture you showed one of their electrical outlets and in the next picture you showed a perfect photo of a person's face. But how do we test for instances where meaningful and meaningless data become a gray area and who gets to decide? Further, there were no definitions to capture the essence of the data that is to be considered meaningful versus the data that is to be considered meaningless. Therefore, the conclusion must be that the test is inconclusive as the standards for the scientific research method are not met since the decision as to whether the data is meaningful or not is a subjective assessment of the tester and therefore bias. So now the next time a person tells you that you are experiencing pareidolia or apothenia when you see faces in the clouds, you can simply tell them that pareidolia can only be determined as such by the person experiencing the phenomena, since any outside source cannot define when the data becomes meaningful. However, that being said, it still does not mean you are not experiencing pareidolia, and therefore you must be true to yourself in order to develop the skill. Based on personal experience, I have noted there is data everywhere, just like data in a database. Unless queried properly, it can be random data, no matter how perfect the vision 
unless a sufficient amount of outside data confirms its meaning. The more confirmations you have, the higher probability your vision may be correct. Just like in stock technical analysis, this is only one parameter in predicting the rise and fall of the stock. However, sometimes it can be very powerful if developed properly. As an example, to prove the Orion Nebula images I have experienced and presented, it was necessary to objectively and continually find more and more connections to this area where the images formed an archetype. Originally I found the highly detailed images. I was able to tie much history to the Orion Nebula and across cultures. Additionally, I was able to prove a pattern recognition match of the images to what was in the churches. All these continual findings allowed me to rely more and more on the images presented in the vision and allowed me to make an educated decision as to whether it contained meaning. The benefits of this type of skill when developed allow one to literally find answers to puzzles without taking the normal process of steps to get there. Bad decisions will leave you chasing your tail. The solution is to be true to yourself, but understand that this is a real science and should not be discarded as the mainstream shrinks would so easily have you believe. So I hope this video is going to help empower you and allow your left brain to be satisfied enough so you can actually experiment with this and possibly develop a new skill because the worst thing that can happen to you is uh, you become a better artist. Y'all take care and I'll talk to you soon.